Reunion night jitters. Michael and I were making out in an empty classroom, leaning against Mrs. Caton's desk. Man, we really hated that math teacher. We'd spent so many times standing at that desk, struggling with algebra and geometry, but now we were kissing and touching each other and breathing heavily. It was so hot. Michael was a bit shorter than me, so I grabbed his chin and lifted his face to look into his eyes. Just as I was about to go in for another kiss, the classroom door swung open. And who walked in? Hannah, followed by Mrs. Caton and our entire class, Caleb and Lenny and my buddies, started fake gagging and puking. And then I woke up, drenched in sweat and all jittery. Damn, I'm almost 30 years old and I'm still having dreams like that? Seriously, a math teacher? Can't I have some more grown up nightmares? But deep down, I knew exactly why I was having these ridiculous dreams. It was because of the upcoming alumni reunion at my old high school. I checked my phone, it was only 7 o'clock. A bit early, but I knew I wouldn't fall back asleep anyway. So I got out of bed, did some work, had lunch, and watched a couple of episodes of a TV show on Netflix. But honestly, I was just trying to distract myself. Finally, I started getting dressed. I had no clue what to wear to a high school reunion. Back in the day, I was known for my laid back style with sweatshirts and jeans. Now I'm more like a shirt and tie, fancy watch type of guy. I could easily show off my serious job and decent income with all of these, but flaunting my career like that felt totally uncool. Really, I was still stressing about how I'd come across to people I hadn't seen in over 10 years. In the end, I settled on high-waisted jeans and a loose, comfortable shirt. I even put on some earrings. I mean, everyone already knew I was gay anyway. I received the invitation to the high school reunion about a month ago via email. Since then, it had been on my mind every single day. Should I even bother going? I'd lost touch with everyone from my class, and honestly, I couldn't care less about what my old friends were up to. But on the other hand, showing up would be a chance to prove that I was doing just fine. That I wasn't the scared, embarrassed gay guy they used to think I was. If I skipped the event, they'd probably figure I chickened out. So in the end, I decided to just go. From New York, it would take me around two hours to drive back to my hometown. I thought it'd be relaxing. I actually enjoy driving. But the whole way there, I was stressed out as if I were heading to final exams instead of a party. I was returning to a place that held mostly bad memories for me. Several times I considered turning around and giving up, but I kept pushing forward. I just hoped I wouldn't have to engage in too much conversation with Michael and Hannah. I didn't feel the need to prove anything to them. Honestly, I would have been perfectly happy if I didn't have to run into them at all. My hometown is pretty dead, not many restaurants or cafes around. I highly doubt there's a dining hall that could fit 80 people here, which is the number of alumni who said they'd come to the reunion. So they decided to hold the event in our high school auditorium, same spot where we had winter balls and midterms years ago. It wasn't until I was in the parking lot in front of the school that I realized I'd been avoiding driving through there whenever I visited my parents. But well, what could I do? I went inside. Near the entrance there was a table with a guest list and assigned seats. Table 7 was my spot. And that was my lucky number, a good sign. Out of curiosity, I checked who else would be sitting at table 7. Patricia, Martha, and Connell. I barely knew them. We had Spanish and PE together, but that's about it. And then there's Michael and Hannah. I thought, really? Someone's gotta be messing with me. This event was shaping up to be a nightmare. So what's the deal with Michael? Let me explain. We had classes together all through high school. I noticed Michael on the very first day because, damn, he was good looking. Beautiful brown eyes, curly dark hair, always a bit too long. He mostly wore black and had this signet ring that made him stand out from the rest of the students in their sweatshirts and sweatpants. Plus, he was really good at English, and we kind of competed in that. But we didn't have much chance to talk at first. We were in completely different social circles. Or maybe I should say that Michael didn't really have a circle. He kept to himself, didn't go to parties, and was maybe not shy, but more withdrawn. Some people made fun of him a bit, on the other hand, I was pretty well liked by everyone. I wasn't a superstar or anything, don't get me wrong, but I was considered one of the cool kids. Confident, talkative, liked by the girls, played sports well, and got invited to all the parties. Now that I'm almost 30, it seems like all those differences between me and Michael were pretty small, but back then, they made it almost impossible for us to get along. Things changed when we both got stuck in remedial math classes. We had to spend an extra two hours every week in Mrs. Cotton's room, trying to grasp the basics. There were only three other people from different classes, so Michael and I kinda had to sit together. Instead of focusing on math, we started talking about books, music, and politics. What are you reading? I asked Michael once, pointing at a book peeking out of his bag. The Brothers Karamazov. Have you read it? Nah, not yet. Is it good? 
It's amazing, even better than Crime and Punishment for me. I can lend it to you once I'm done. I was a bit surprised and even a little scared. We definitely had the brothers Karamazov in the school library, and Michael knew that. So why did he want to lend it to me? Was he trying to befriend me, or was he, like, hitting on me? Did he suspect that I was gay? That thought terrified me. I thought I was doing a great job of hiding it. By the time Michael finished reading the brothers Karamazov, Mrs. Cotton had separated us into different benches because we kept talking. I kind of missed our conversations, but at the same time, I felt relieved. I thought the issue had resolved itself. Well, I was wrong. One day after a remedial math class, Michael came up to me with his copy of the brothers Karamazov. Here, I'm done, he said, handing me the book. Let me know what you think later. And he smiled in a way that left no room for doubt. Yeah, he was definitely flirting with me. I opened the book on the bus ride home. I was excited and scared, as if I were doing something low-key illegal. You can only imagine how I felt when I found a folded note with my name in it tucked inside the book. My hands were trembling as I opened it. It was a short and clear message. Meet me tomorrow after school behind the locker rooms. So naturally, we met behind those locker rooms and it played out exactly as you'd expect. Michael rambled on about the brothers Karamazov, but I don't even remember what he was saying. Then we started kissing passionately, like we'd been waiting for it for months and had nothing else on our minds during math class. After that, we started meeting up regularly in secluded spots around the school, behind the locker rooms, in the hallway near the library, or in the chemistry lab to make out. We also started opening up to each other not just about books and stuff. We shared stories about our families, dreams, plans, and the pets we had as kids. I was terrified that someone would find out about our secret affair. I was genuinely paranoid. Every little thing my classmates said made me think they knew. At the same time, I believed that if they found out, they'd all distance themselves from me. Not only was I dating a guy, but I was also dating a guy who was disliked and made fun of. To protect my reputation and deflect suspicion, I did something terrible. I started dating Hannah from my class. Hannah was pretty, popular, athletic, and funny. She had blonde hair, blue eyes, and a cute nose. She looked like a supermodel, but beneath all that, she was a bit insecure or desperated. All it took was a smile and a couple of lame compliments, and we became a couple. We played video games at my place, went to parties together, ate fast food in my car, basically acted like good buddies. We also had sex a few times, although neither of us really enjoyed it. Are you sure you like me? Hannah would often ask, as if she sensed something was off. Don't you feel like I'm kind of average, or I'm lacking something? No, come on, I'd reassure her. You're super cool and hot. That was the best compliment I could come up with. Ironically enough, it was through my relationship with Hannah that my affair with Michael got exposed. It was our senior year at the time. Hannah must have had her suspicions because one day after school, she decided to follow me. She saw Michael and I kissing behind the locker rooms, thinking we were hidden from the whole world as usual, and she took pictures. I can still see them vividly. I look scared, awkward, and unsure of myself. Definitely not the happy, outgoing straight guy I pretended to be in front of everyone. And then Hannah sent those photos to all her friends, so basically, the whole school got them. And the worst part? Nobody really cared about the photos. The people who were supposed to mock and torment me just shrugged. Jacob's gay? Okay, fine, his business. He's dating Michael. Well, it's not surprising. They could actually make a good couple. The only thing people accused me of was treating Hannah poorly and lying to her. And that was it. All my hiding had been for nothing. But even though nobody cared, we ended things with Michael anyway. Why? I have no idea. Maybe just in case, or maybe it was a matter of principle. All I know is that we both had a strong sense it had to be done. But yeah, back to the high school reunion. When I approached my table, Michael was already sitting there, still rocking his long dark hair. He had on a black shirt and black pants. Surprisingly, I could tell he was genuinely happy to see me. Jacob, hey, he said, getting up for a hug. I was worried you wouldn't come. How have you been? I heard you became a lawyer. Yeah, uh, yeah, I stuttered. Michael's touch brought back the intensity we had in high school. I mainly work in family law, you know, handling divorces and stuff, I explained as we sat down. From the corner of my eye, I noticed Hannah, who was also at the table. Luckily, quite far from us, she was engrossed in a conversation with Patricia. And what do you do for a living? I asked Michael. I'm a journalist, he replied. Oh, really? I don't know why people are always surprised, he laughed. Is this job totally unfitting for me? No, not at all. It suits you well, actually, I said. I just always thought you'd become some 19th century dead Russian writer or something. A journalist seems a bit too normal of a choice. 
Believe me, it's really interesting. Sometimes I write about situations as twisted as the ones in the Brothers Karamazov, he said with a provocative smile, and I could feel myself blushing. Damn it, Jacob, act like an adult! We spent most of the evening together. We didn't have any other social obligations, since we hadn't kept in touch with anyone else in the room. It was surprisingly laid back, as if we'd seen each other just the day before, instead of a decade ago. We talked about everything, family, past relationships, even hookups, as if we weren't surrounded by people we'd always tried to hide from. After dinner, the former school chairperson announced over the microphone that everyone should hit the dance floor. A few people smiled shyly, and some laughed awkwardly. I thought we were all still way too sober to start dancing. In the next 10 minutes, only 5 or 6 couples made it to the dance floor. Wanna dance? Michael suddenly asked me. I almost choked on my wine. Are you crazy? I asked. Why? Are you still embarrassed to be seen with me? He joked. But seeing my expression, I think he realized it was too much. I was never ashamed of you, I said honestly, struggling to find the right words. The atmosphere grew serious. I knew there was only one way to salvage the situation. Okay, I said, let's hit that dance floor. I grabbed his hand and pulled him along. I felt like everyone was watching us, even though that probably wasn't the case. We stood almost in the middle of the dance floor and started dancing awkwardly. We bumped into each other a few times and Michael even stepped on my foot. I wasn't even sure who was leading. We were terrible at it. I could dance in clubs, but slow dancing as a couple? Never my strong suit. Eventually, we burst into laughter, drawing stares from other dancers. See? We're doing great, Michael said. Everyone's watching us. We danced together until the end of the song, completely out of sync and lacking coordination. There was something romantic about it, like a pair of clumsy high schoolers. Michael's hands on my back felt just as they did ten years ago. I'm gonna go smoke, I announced when we finished dancing and returned to the table. Seriously, you still haven't quit? Michael shook his head. Oh, I've quit. Like, twelve times now. I left through the back door of the school, leaned against the wall, and lit up. From there, I could see the locker rooms where Michael and I used to hang out. I was prepared to dwell in melancholic memories when I noticed someone standing beside me. It was Hannah. Mind if I join for a smoke? She asked. Honestly, I would have told her to fuck off, but in the spirit of being adults, I handed her a pack of cigarettes. Besides, I probably hurt her just as much as she hurt me, so I shouldn't be mad. Listen, she said, lighting the cigarette. I wanted to apologize. Sending out those pictures was seriously messed up on my part. It was a dick move. Your coming out should have been your business, not mine. Yeah, well, it happened. It's over. No regrets, I lied. Then I added more genuinely, and I'm sorry for using you like that. Pretending to be straight was cruel. I don't think I'm the person to hold a grudge about it, Hannah laughed. I looked at her with confusion, and she raised an eyebrow in surprise. Don't you know? I'm a lesbian, Jacob. I dated you for the same reason you dated me. At the time, I hadn't realized it yet. I convinced myself that liking girls was just a phase, and it would pass as I grew older. I wanted a boyfriend to speed up that process. I sent those pictures of you and Michael because, well, you know, they represented everything I hated about myself. I sent them not because I was hurt, but because I was homophobic. And I was homophobic because I was a lesbian. I blinked several times, finding it hard to believe just what I was hearing. Hannah had always seemed like the most straight person in the world. This Patricia sitting at our table, Hannah continued, is my partner. We're getting married next June. I burst into laughter. It all felt absurd. Hannah laughed too. We stood at the back of the school, smoking, laughing, and gazing at the stars. It would have been incredibly romantic if we weren't both gay. But we were, so the whole situation was just super cool. The alumni reunion ended around 2 in the morning. Groups of old friends headed to after parties, some got into cars, while others walked to bars. Hannah and Patricia bid farewell to Michael and I, mentioning they'd be happy to meet for coffee if they happened to be in New York. In New York, I asked Michael once we were alone, do you think they live there too? Well, if they do, they're right, said Michael. Did you think I'm a journalist here? I doubt there's even a newspaper in this city. I moved to Brooklyn about three years ago. Why are you so shocked? Did you think only lawyers live in New York? N no, I, I just didn't realize we lived in the same city. Well, we do, Michael stated. So, maybe you'd like to grab some drinks with me soon. I looked at him, surprised. Was our story about to come full circle? It's about my sister, Michael added after a while, and I sighed in sorrow. She's going through a difficult divorce. She and her husband have three kids and can't agree on anything, especially custody. Since you handle family law, of course, I'm not pushing it. I know you probably get requests like this now and then. Yeah, it's true, I laughed, but I won't refuse you. Let's say next week. We can meet and discuss the divorce. Just send me an email beforehand with the details, okay? So I have time to think about how to tackle it. 
Sure, thanks a lot, Jacob, I'll see you then. We hugged, God, it felt so great, and went our separate ways, to our parents' homes, just like back in high school. Two days later, Michael emailed me the details of his sister's divorce. I still remembered her from high school. Her name was Eva, and she was five years younger than us. She used to change boyfriends frequently. Settling down before 30 didn't seem like her thing. And now, what, she was 24 and already had kids? Crazy. Contrary to what Michael had said, the case was simple and straightforward. I figured Eva must have gotten a terrible lawyer. I summarized the important information in my reply to Michael and suggested meeting at my favorite bar. Honestly, the whole thing could have been handled with just a couple of emails, but I really wanted to meet with him. We had a great conversation at the alumni reunion, and finding out we lived in the same city just added to the intrigue. I wasn't usually sentimental or naive, but it felt like fate was giving me a second chance. This time, I arrived first at the bar, already sipping on a beer when Michael walked in. He greeted me with a hug. Did he have any idea how that affected me? Thanks again for agreeing to handle this, he said. No problem, it's an easy matter. The husband sounds like a total asshole. Where did Eva even find him? Oh, you know, some college party or something. I don't have all the details. I was a bit surprised because, based on Michael's email, Eva's husband worked as a plumber. Why would he be at a college party? It wouldn't have caught my attention so much if Michael hadn't lowered his gaze, as if he were caught in a lie. Something felt off. Nevertheless, I explained my approach to the divorce case, showing Michael the important regulations and jotting down a few notes. I asked him to send my regards to Eva, and then we had another beer each, discussed some lighter topics, and left the bar. It was already dark, as dark as it gets in New York. The purple glow from a nearby bar's neon lights illuminated Michael's face. He looked stunning. I just had to raise my hand and brush a long strand of hair behind his ear, a gesture I'd made countless times in high school. He smiled, but I immediately felt the need to apologize. This level of intimacy was something I could indulge in when we were a couple, not now, meeting for the second time in 10 years. But before I could formulate an apology, we were kissing. Just like that first time behind the locker rooms, passionate, full of longing. I gently lifted Michael's chin, just as I had dreamed of doing. The neon light cast upon us made it feel like we were on a stage, basking in the spotlight. And even though it seemed like everyone was watching, I didn't care at all. I never should have cared. Finally, we pulled away, breathless and exhilarated. Look, listen, I have to tell you something, Michael said. I feared he was about to back out, to say it was a mistake. My sister, she's not really getting a divorce. She doesn't have a husband or children, and as far as I know, she doesn't even have a boyfriend. I made it up to get you to agree to meet me. Back at the reunion, you seemed like you were going to reject me. I'm, I'm sorry, it was stupid of me. I understand if it's a deal breaker for you. I felt like a weight had been lifted off of my heart, so Michael felt the same chemistry as I did, and once again, he had tried to make a move, this time not with the brothers Karamazov, but with his sister's fictional divorce. It worked even better. A deal breaker, are you kidding? I chuckled. Michael, no one's ever lied to me so romantically. Recently, Michael and I officially became a couple. For almost three months before that, we'd been meeting for dinner, coffee, wine, or movie nights. We started in the city and eventually ventured into each other's apartments. We even went out for karaoke once, just to prove to Michael that I could sing and dance, just not at some awkward alumni reunion. And of course, he had to admit I was right. I've met his wonderful friends, passionate journalists, gay activists, a writer, and an opera singer. Yes, Michael has a lot of friends, and he no longer resembles that withdrawn, unapproachable guy from high school. And I'm not the same Jacob from back then either. We've both changed a lot. And sometimes it's challenging, or even sad to realize we're not the same people we initially fell in love with. But overall, it's mostly wonderful to rediscover each other, become friends again, and fall in love all over again. This time without lies, fear, or hiding. Oh, and a while ago, Hannah and Patricia reached out to us. They're coming to New York for Patricia's job and asked if we'd like to grab a beer together. If that's not a plot twist, I don't know what is. Have you ever given someone a second chance? Did you regret it? Thanks for watching. Consider subscribing to become a part of our Rainbow Force and stay wholesome.